I'm Joe Fryer. And I'm Savannah Sellers. We are going to get started this morning with the Republican National Convention in Milwaukee, where former President Trump will officially accept the party's nomination later tonight. Last night, it was his running mate, Ohio Senator J.D. Vance, who took center stage. The 39-year-old, a relative political newcomer, introduced himself to a national audience just two days after becoming Mr. Trump's pick for VP. Senator Vance laid out his vision for a potential second Trump administration to his fellow Republicans. That's the Republican Party of the next four years, united in our love for this country and committed to free speech and the open exchange of ideas. I stand here humbled and I'm overwhelmed with gratitude to say I officially accept your nomination to be Vice President of the United States of America. We are also learning new details this morning about last weekend's assassination attempt against the former president. According to sources familiar with a briefing given to U.S. senators on Wednesday, the gunman who opened fire aimed at Mr. Trump was reported as a suspicious person and photographed one hour before that shooting at that rally in Pennsylvania. Meanwhile, President Biden is back in Delaware today after testing positive for COVID while attending campaign events in Las Vegas. Mr. Biden's symptoms included a runny nose and a cough. The president also tested positive for COVID back in 2020. We have team coverage ahead this morning, including the latest on the attempted assassination and more on President Biden's health. But let's begin with NBC News correspondent Von Hilliard from the RNC in Milwaukee. We're also joined by NBC News senior national politics reporter Jonathan Allen. Good morning to both of you. Von, walk us through Senator Vance's speech. What is making headlines this morning? For J.D. Vance, this was very much of an introduction of himself to the country. Of course, he wrote Hillbilly Elegy, which was the best-selling novel. But in many ways, this was a speech to a national audience in which he detailed his upbringing and poverty in the Rust Belt. And his mother, who has been sober for 10 years, he helped share her story of once being uh, addicted to opioid. He, and he weaved his own personal story with that of where the country finds itself and why he has turned to Donald Trump and to join this ticket in sort of a populist message here. I want to let you listen to a little bit more of J.D. Vance's speech. President Trump represents America's last best hope to restore what, if lost, may never be found again. A country where a working class boy born far from the halls of power can stand on this stage as the next vice president of the United States of America. I pledge to every American, no matter your party, I will give you everything I have to serve you and to make this country a place where every dream you have for yourself, your family, and your country will be possible once again. J.D. fans focused on the need to increase the number of jobs, particularly manufacturing jobs in the United States. He called out illegal immigration, suggesting that the millions of individuals who have made their way to the country undocumented over the years caused a housing crisis, caused a jobs crisis, everything which led to increase in inflation. For J.D. Vance, well, he is very specific on the policy front. He also is calling for unity. And this was a moment here for him to also cast that generational divide, noting that when Joe Biden was in the U.S. Senate, he voted in favor of NAFTA when J.D. Vance himself was just in the fourth grade. John, let's bring you in here in his speech. Vance shared his background, as Vaughn just told us, and branded President Biden as a career politician who had been in Washington since before he was born, as, as Vaughn is, is pointing out here. This was a big moment for Vance. What stood out to you as he introduced himself to voters? Tell us some of the policy stuff also that he got into. Yeah, I think very much, Savannah, that... Uh... If you're looking at what stands out, there's a combination here, of course, of the biographical, the vice presidential candidate uh, introducing himself, as uh, uh, Vaughn said, to America, but also uh, a little bit of the attack dog. That's part of the role of the vice presidential candidate is to uh, risk his own reputation a little bit to attack uh, on behalf of the presidential candidate, in this case, Donald Trump, who, of course, for everybody who's watched him, probably didn't need anybody to do any attacking for him. Um, but, you know, look, you saw Vance talk about uh, what he saw as a little bit of libertarianism, I think, um, you know, talking about uh, freedom of speech and, uh, you know, supporting uh, the free exchange of ideas. Uh, I'm sure there are Democrats who quibble with him on uh, what his solutions would be. Certainly something he talked about there. 
Vaughn, let's look ahead and talk about the final day of the convention. We're going to hear from former President Trump, the first time he's spoken in public since last weekend's assassination attempt. There have been these reports. We're going to hear a different message, a different tone than we would have heard perhaps before what happened Saturday. Of course, yesterday we did start to hear Republicans use that stage to attack Democrats a little bit more. So what can we expect today? Right. I was talking to a senior advisor to the former president yesterday, and he indicated to me that... Donald Trump has been dictating his speech and what he wanted to convey, <clears throat> suggesting that it will be powerful, it will be beautiful, were the words of this advisor, and reflective. This, for Donald Trump, is a moment three months out where he sees himself politically in a strong position, strong in polling across the country and in key battleground states, and an opportunity coming off of Saturday, one where he had a near-death experience, one that I, and I know you guys, we have not been through ourselves, in which the advisor suggested that that reshaped the way that he was going to deliver this speech, rewriting it and wanting to focus on a vision of unity. Of course, for Donald Trump, he is somebody who has uh, uh, repeatedly uh, called for what you could call retribution against his perceived political enemies and the prosecutors who uh, who ultimately charged him on criminal charges on four indictments over the last year. And so the question here is just three months out, to what extent did this weekend's attempted assassination truly change his approach? Or for Donald Trump, is unity a matter of finding a way to beat Joe Biden and having these, uh, the, these charges against him either dropped, like we saw in Florida, the classified documents case earlier this week, and all but forcing Democrats to uh, uh, to uh, essentially end their own criticisms and rhetoric towards him. John, it sort of seems as Vaughn's laying out that former President Trump has at least some momentum on his side right now. W walk us through his remarks tonight. If we do hear that tonal shift as we are anticipating, where does that mean the campaign goes from here? Do you think that sticks with four months until the election? I don't think there's any question that Donald Trump has momentum right now. You're looking right now at a uh, Democratic Party that is very much uh, in, uh, and uh, you know, to sort of use a cliche here, in disarray. Uh, there are many Democrats that are asking Donald, uh, sorry, asking Joe Biden to get out of the campaign right now. Uh, that is not going on on the Republican side. So if you project forward a little bit, uh, if Joe Biden is able to uh, continue as the Democratic nominee, uh, he's going to have a lot of work to do to uh, organize and unify his party. We're looking right now at a Republican Party uh, that is pretty unified behind Trump. Uh, our country is very polarized. You could expect in most elections that the, the, at this point they're going to be pretty close between Democrats and Republicans. But I don't think there's any question that uh, Donald Trump is at uh, you know, sort of uh, at a high point right now, and Democrats are scrambling and, and at a low point. All right, Vaughn and John, thank you both. Appreciate it. We're going to have much more from the Republican National Convention throughout the day here on NBC News Now. We'll bring you former President Trump's remarks live. Our coverage gets underway tonight at 9 p.m. Eastern, 6 o'clock Pacific time on NBC News Now and on NBC. Well, as Republicans wrap up their convention in Milwaukee, as we mentioned, President Biden was forced to cancel his campaign event in Las Vegas yesterday after announcing he's tested positive for COVID. Mr. Biden returned to Delaware last night. In a statement, the White House says that he will self-isolate but continue to carry out his duties until he is fully recovered. The president had a full schedule in the critical battleground state of Nevada this week, including a conference for Latino advocates. This was the moment attendees were notified the president had to cancel. Regrettably, I was just on the phone with President Biden, and he shared his deep disappointment at not being able to join us this afternoon. The president has been at many events, as we all know, and uh, he just tested positive for COVID. NBC News White House correspondent Ali Rafa joins us now from Delaware, where the president is self-isolating. Ali, good morning. What are we learning this morning about the president's diagnosis? How serious are the symptoms? 
Yeah, Savannah, good morning. The president waking up at his Rehoboth Beach, Delaware home this morning as he begins recovering from COVID-19, as you mentioned, after cutting his trip to Battleground, Nevada short yesterday. We saw him boarding Air Force One, deboarding Air Force One yesterday, walking very slowly, but the president telling reporters that travel with him that he was feeling good, at one point giving them a thumbs up. And yesterday, the president's doctor, who he travels with regularly, said in a statement that he's suffering from upper respiratory symptoms that include a runny nose, a non-productive cough, just general malaise. He says he felt okay for the first event of his day in Nevada, but given that he was not feeling better, point-of-care testing for COVID-19 was conducted and the results were positive for the COVID-19 virus. His doctor adding that he is taking the drug Paxlovid to help with those symptoms and to prevent this be to in, uh, from becoming a more serious illness. But of course, with the president's age being 81 years old, we expect him to be monitored very very closely in the coming days, Savannah. I mean, yeah, Allie, Democrats were already worried about the president's health and his age before the COVID announcement. And the president did touch on that issue in an interview last night before his diagnosis. Let's listen to that. If there had some medical condition that emerged, if somebody, if the doctors came to me and said, you got this problem, that problem. But I made a serious mistake in the, in the, in the whole debate. Still, these calls for him to step aside are growing. Now, Congressman Adam Schiff running for the open Senate seat in California. He's joining the chorus. And we're also learning about Senate Majority Leader Chuck Schumer's meeting with the president over the weekend. What more can you tell us about that? And, and can Mr. Biden afford to be off the campaign trail right now? Yeah, this really could not come at a worse time for the president. As you mentioned, his travel, his schedule has ramped up as he tries to prove Democrats, to try to prove to the American people that he can stay in this race, that he can serve another four years in office if reelected. Of course, with this diagnosis for the next few days, he is not able to do that. And of course, we are seeing these growing calls from Democratic lawmakers for him to step aside, for him to pass the torch. Over 20 Democratic lawmakers now doing that. You mentioned Congressman Adam Schiff, a longtime Biden ally, coming out yesterday and making that call. And now we're learning more about uh, the president's face-to-face -face private meeting that he had with Senate Majority Leader Chuck Schumer, a longtime friend of the president's. They met here in Rehoboth Beach last weekend, and we're told uh, that Schumer, during that meeting, shared with the president polling data that shows potential vulnerabilities down the ballot if the president does stay at the top of the Democratic uh, ticket. Now, a senior White House official is saying that the, despite this diagnosis, the president's intention to stay in this race is not changing. But of course, with this mounting pressure, you have to think how the president is weighing this decision in the coming days, guys, especially in the wake of this diagnosis. Absolutely. Ali, thank you so much. This morning, we're getting a new timeline of events leading up to the attempted assassination of former President Trump on Saturday. Multiple sources tell NBC News that the FBI and Secret Service told senators at a briefing yesterday that police identified the gunman as suspicious an hour before the shooting. They added that the Pennsylvania State Police only notified, though, the Secret Service 20 minutes before the incident happened. The information comes as a new video appears to show the shooter walking around at the rally before Mr. Trump took the stage. Wyoming's Republican Senator John Barrasso blasted the new details provided in yesterday's briefing and called on the Secret Service director to step down. It was a cover your ass briefing by the by the Secret Service. Uh, the, the director of the Secret Service needs to go. That shooter was identified as a suspect, a suspicious character, a full one hour before the shooting occurred. Had a rangefinder, a backpack, and then they lost sight of him and never really followed up on that. This was an hour before. NBC News Homeland Security correspondent Julia Ainsley joins us now. Julia, walk us through what else we're learning from yesterday's briefing by the FBI and Secret Service to senators. What were some of the key moments leading up to the shooting? Well, we should point out when he talks about this, he talks about one hour before, that's when Pennsylvania State Police and other local authorities identified him, in part because there were people in the crowd, rally goers, near those magnetometers where they're being scanned to enter the rally, who said, look, he looks suspicious, he was pacing around. They did identify that he had a rangefinder, but Secret Service found out 20 minutes before 
the shooting. And it was at 553 that they identified the snipers in the area. Still, Trump was allowed to take the stage at 602. And as we know, those shots were fired at 611. So really, this fuller timeline that members of Congress were able to get in the briefing yesterday did nothing to assuage fears that Secret Service had this handled or that this was a one-off thing. It seemed as though they really delegated far too much responsibility to the local law enforcement. And you have to remember, this is a pretty rural area, the sniper team that was supposed to be inside this building, and that's what the Secret Service director initially said, then changed yesterday to say they were in an adjacent building. That sniper team was not Secret Service. They all came from outside a local law enforcement team, a unit that was put together from various counties and townships. But the Secret Service actually put that roof, that building, outside of their secure perimeter, even though it was less than one, or 200 yards away from where Trump would be speaking. So I think we're going to start to hear more calls like what we heard from Senator Barrasso. We're also hearing from police unions who are upset about the way the situation was handled even after the fact. They think too much blame went to local police. And really a reckoning here with why Secret Service outsources so much responsibility to locals. Shortly after the event, they were saying, oh, they know that local police know the area better than we do, but they're not trained in the same way that Secret Service would be to secure a protectee. So a lot of questions and, and perhaps a lot of change will come, especially after Congress doesn't just ask these questions, but we know of other multiple independent reviews that are also going on to try to get to the bottom of why these decisions were made and should they have stepped in and not allow the president to take the stage with the information that they had on the suspicious person at the time. Julia, you mentioned that discrepancy about the team that we were told was staged within that building, uh, not on top of it, I think was the first question. But now we've learned, as you mentioned, that it was actually not that building. It was an adjacent building. Now we have this new timeline about the gunman being someone of note to authorities in the area. What are we hearing from the Secret Service about how they're defending some of the decisions that were made? And as we hear what sounds at least to a regular person like some failures in the system. Yeah, again, they keep pointing back to the fact that this fell out of their secure perimeter. They say that, you know, if they wanted to expand this to a thousand yards, they would be in people's neighborhoods. But this is far shorter than that. Another answer we're getting a lot is we'll, we'll have an independent investigation get to the bottom of that. They cannot answer the question, for example, of why Trump was allowed to take the stage and whether or not that was a breach of protocol. Of course, at the time, they didn't know the suspicious person was armed. We understand they knew he had a backpack and a rangefinder, which is used to measure the distance when you're trying to set up a shot from a sniper position, but they didn't know that he had a rifle at that time. So a lot of these questions right now aren't being answered because these independent reviews are ongoing. But I don't think that that would slow down the timeline for pressure to build on Director Sheetal for her to have to have some really sharp answers, especially next week when she goes before two committees. And if not, we're probably going to see more pressure on her for to step down from her position. Julia, no doubt we're going to see a lot of investigations here. That now includes the DHS Inspector General opening an investigation. Real quick, what can we expect with that? Well, the DHS Inspector General actually just opened a second investigation yesterday, Joe, not only to Secret Service planning overall, but specifically yesterday into the counter sniper team preparedness. They want to know why Secret Service, Secret Service snipers that are paid by taxpayers so well trained to take out threats just like this one of someone on a roof firing at a protectee, why they weren't able to take him out. Did it have something to do with the slope of the roof? Were they not able to see him? Was it a communication failure? Does it have something more to do with the planning that they outsource this very vulnerable spot. As we've reported here on, at NBC, that very roof was identified in a planning meeting as a vulnerability. So why didn't the sniper team do more to prepare and protect against a possibility of, of a shooter from there? A lot of questions, uh, but we are getting a little more color here, a little more understanding of the timeline, also learning that the sniper spent a few days before the event, the shooter, to, to scope the area. Um, a lot more details, not necessarily anything more assuring, um, but definitely likely to put more pressure on this agency to, to try to explain themselves or make some big changes in the coming weeks and months ahead. All right, Julia, thank you so much.
Well, Senator Bob Menendez is facing mounting calls from within his own party to resign just days after being found guilty on all counts in his federal corruption trial. Now the question is, will he resign or will Summit Democrats move to expel him? Two people directly familiar with behind-the-scenes conversations have told NBC News that Menendez has been notifying his allies of his intentions to step down. But there's some confusion here. Menendez later told CBS News on Wednesday that he has not resigned or spoken to, quote, so-called allies, adding it seems like an effort to try to force him into a statement. He did not respond to our requests for comments. Joining us now for more on this is NBC News Capitol Hill correspondent Ali Vitali. Ali, good morning. So bring us up to speed here. What do we know about what Menendez has been saying following his conviction and tell us what we've heard from what the senator later referred to as his so-called allies in that statement that Joe just read. Well, look, we saw Menendez right outside the court. He said that he was going to file an appeal on this. No surprise there. We've seen the way that he has consistently said that these charges are false. Of course, the jury found him guilty on all of those. But we're learning from yesterday's conversations with allies of the senator that he has been making calls to tell them that he intends to resign. Now, that doesn't mean that he has resigned. It doesn't mean that that is imminent. There's no timeline on that. But our sources are telling us that that is his intention. Of course, Menendez then came out in the hours after NBC News filed that reporting to say that he's not talking to so-called allies in his words, but that doesn't mean that this resignation isn't imminent. And of course, there are other senators too. You referenced the fact that pressure's building on this on Capitol Hill. Many of Menendez's own colleagues, even before this verdict wanted him to resign, now in the aftermath of the verdict, they say they absolutely want him out. And if he doesn't do it, they will move to expel him. So Ali, we know that he's running as as an independent this year. So what happens if he steps yeah. down before then or if he's expelled? Well, the independent bid, while it's not typically the way that you would watch a Democratic senator run for re-election, was always contingent, in our understanding, on being exonerated in this trial. Of course, that is exactly the opposite of what's happened. And so you have to imagine, although these are two separate questions, that resigning early from his term in the Senate means that he will no longer be pursuing that independent bid. But this was always one of two political questions that were facing the New Jersey senator in the aftermath of that court ruling, which which is that, is he going to continue to finish out his term? And is he going to continue running for another? Right now, it sounds like we might have the answer to one of those questions that allies are telling us that he's telling them he intends to resign. At the same time, we don't know what that means for the actual re-election bid. Again, it would stand to reason and it would stand to assume that that bid would go away, but unclear at this point. And Ali, with Senate Majority Leader Chuck Schumer joining the many calls for Menendez to step down, what message are Democrats hoping to send voters ahead of November with this pressure campaign in light of this conviction? We watch Democrats be very aware of the fact that this was all happening. These legal proceedings against their colleague were all happening against the backdrop of Republicans trying to level this unfounded claim that there are two tiers to the system of justice. Republicans, of course, saying that because of all of former President Donald Trump's legal woes. Democrats pointing to things like Hunter Biden as well as Bob Menendez to say, no, there is not. Democrats are being prosecuted when they are doing something wrong, too. Even before this, and we just mentioned this, th more than 30 Senate Democrats came out before Menendez as his trial, just when the allegations had started, to say this man needs to step down. He, of course, renounced his title as the head of the powerful chair of, foreign, of the Foreign Relations Committee. But for many of his colleagues, that wasn't enough. This verdict has only made those calls louder. Now more than 40 of his colleagues, including the Senate Majority Leader, has said that Menendez has to go. And as much as this is something that's happening in the halls of Congress, I think you guys are right to point out the messaging to voters on this, which is that Democrats want to make clear corruption within their ranks is not something that they want to tolerate. It's also why we're seeing these senators say either resign yourself or we'll help you find the exit because they don't want to have someone like this serving within their ranks. All right. Ali Vitale, thanks for your reporting here. Time now for a check on your morning news now weather. It certainly was stormy last night here in New York. Oh it looks like another so stormy day ahead for parts of the country. <laughs> Meteorologist Violetta Yass joins us this morning. Hey, Violetta. Hey, yes, so that is exactly right. Very stormy last night. In fact, the high wind reports, uh, just the high wind reports, 165 of them in roughly the last 12 hours or so. We had a lot of them up across New York State, especially. Now, we have had that front uh, dip a little bit further to the south, but still close enough to touch off some severe weather. 
weather this afternoon and evening. Five million people at risk here for damaging winds and hail. The tornado risk relatively low. And you can see that bullseye area from right around Norfolk through Elizabeth City extending down in through Cape Hatteras later today. Here we have that front progressing south. So that cold front dipping into the southeast. So we'll see those scattered severe storms possible from the deep south into the Carolinas. For tomorrow, notice it doesn't make too much more progress. So it's still going to be on the stormy side. We'll see more showers and thunderstorms along that front and localized flooding is going to be possible along with perhaps some uh, locally gusty winds. Now behind this front, something you probably did already notice, that more comfortable air settling in to the Great Lakes, the Midwest and into the Northeast as well. Now the one day temperature change in New York City, only two degrees, but that lower humidity making a big difference. The temperature change a little bit more drastic here uh, in places like Chicago, down through Cincinnati, Pittsburgh as well. So much cooler and feeling much better and not so hot this weekend. Temperatures do start to climb a little bit by Sunday. Many places along that I-95 corridor will be a little bit closer to 90 degrees. But again, with lower humidity, it won't be too bad out there. Meanwhile, as we enjoy the cooler temperatures and the lower humidity, the heat starts to shift into the west where temperatures will actually be increasing. You can see we'll be right back into triple digits in places like Salt Lake City, Boise up to 102, Reading 106, so getting much warmer out there. And with that, we do have some heat alerts here. 31 million people impacted, parts of California into parts of Arizona and up into the Pacific Northwest as well. Now you combine that heat uh, along with low humidity and some potentially gusty winds. We may get enough lightning strikes to touch off dry storms, which could then touch off uh, some fires. So we're gonna watch out for that as well, we're sort of shifting all of that heat out to the West now. Right. Meanwhile, for uh, us here in the Northeast, it does cool down a little bit, it'll be less humid. And we do get a break from the storms as well. I think we really need that here across the Northeast. A, a reprieve of both those yes. things. All right, awesome thank you. Awesome to hear, thanks. Thanks for watching. Stay updated about breaking news and top stories on the NBC News app or follow us on social media.